good morning everyone uh, so as usual we will start our next session uh, today uh, very important topic and uh, you know very important topic will be taken by a very important team of palliative medicine from india and that is uh, ester cmi and uh, dr amelia sahana will explain you uh, what exactly we will be, we should be doing when uh, there is a, a patient is on inotropic therapy or non invasive ventilation or if it is required what are the ethical dilemmas in such patients and this will be moderated by dr raghavender i can't see raghavender right now still so uh, we all know raghavender very well those who are sending articles i think they must be knowing raghavender raghavender is a uh, editor of indian journal of palliative care and he is a truly a good uh, truly a uh, trained pain physician of this country and he has been trained in <clears throat> interventional pain in uh, singapore from singapore and from usa and he is also a true palliative care physician and he is a lead consultant of palliative medicine at and rehabilitation at ester cmi hospital bangalore bangalore and his area of interest interest in are interventional pain management neuropathic pain cancer pain chronic pain and end of life care similarly area of expert ex interest of amelia are cancer pain pediatric palliative care end of life care and bereavement so all palliative care physician have similar area of interest most of the time good so amelia everyone is waiting to hear you and uh, hmm, everyone can write their question and answer and by the time this class will start dr raghavender will join and he will moderate this session at the end so anybody has any question and answer please question or queries please write down in the chat box thank you very much start amelia okay uh, good morning everybody uh, ma'am thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity um, my topic given today was inotropic therapy and non invasive ventilation in palliative care um, an ethical dilemma so um through this uh, next 45 minutes uh, to 40 to 45 minutes i thought we would just brief, uh, briefly go through the anatomy and physiology of respiration because if we have to understand what niv is and where we come from and where we are going we need to know how things work understand the concepts of respiratory failure and uh, niv uh, its modalities what is its use in palliative medicine the uh, ethical dilemma as my topic is then go on to inotropes and its ethical dilemma so let's just start with the anatomy uh, of breathing um as we all know the respiratory system doesn't start from the trachea it starts actually from your nasal cavity it goes on to your oral cavity the pharynx then the larynx then the bronchus and then the lungs and of course in the lungs in the chest cavity what you have is the uh, the actual parenchyma of the lungs the pleural cavity the pleural linings the visceral and the parietal the chest uh, wall which is made up of the bony cage and the muscles so why is this important it's important because an abnormality a deficiency a problem a disease in any of these aspects of the anatomy would then lead to a problem in what we would take for granted that is breathing as far as the physiology goes we all know that we cannot actually work uh, independently through the nose and the trachea we need something that actually makes us coordinate all of these movements and the centers are basically in the central um, uh, the central uh, the regulators that are there in the brain and they are triggered by changes within the ph in the blood which is the carbon dioxide oxygen that are picked up by the aortic and the carotid uh, chemoreceptors and they further signal the central centers in the brain so as you can understand there is a uh, a bony cage there is a place that actually does the mechanical work of breathing there is the entire passage that conducts the airway that would actually if anything is wrong with that we would have a problem and we have a central place that actually controls and coordinates this entire process so which is the narrowest part in our pharynx which could actually cause a problem in our breathing now because i'm talking about uh, niv one of the most um, commonly associated for any non palliative 
uh, early uh, problems is also obstructive sleep apnea. But I'm not going to be talking much about that. But why do we need that? You could have malignancies in the oral cavity. You could nasopharyngeal malignancies. You could have a whole lot of problems that cause difficulty in breathing. And we need to understand that. So in the pharyngeal space, there is the one behind the soft palate, and it is the retropalatine space. And the tensor palatine muscle is the one that actually helps pull the soft palate in front, allowing the air to go through. The genioglossus is the muscle which is in the retroglossal space that allows the passage to be open to go through. And the hyoid bone and all your muscles that are attached to the hyoid bone, that again in the retroglottic space, epiglottic space that allow the epiglottis and the areas to come in front in order for the breathing to happen. In order for the air to go through, these areas should be well opened. And that is where the positioning of the head and the positioning of the body come into great importance. The bronchial tree is also important because as you all know, there is a conducting zone and then there is the transitional and then the respiratory zone. The gas exchange, the air exchange takes place in your respiratory zones, whereas the, the rest of it are mainly conductors. The cartilage that keeps the trachea open can go through and decreases in the uh, coverage of the bronchial tree as it comes down, as the generations go down. And this is important, again, because we need to understand where the alveoli are. We need to understand where the gas exchange takes place and where the problem is. If we have a basic understanding in this overview, then we can actually go down to what we in physiology have learned. These are our volumes and our capacities. And it's under, important to understand this because it is based on this that non-invasive ventilation works. So what will we breathe in? This is our normal tidal volume. What is a tidal volume? It is the amount of air that we naturally take in and we breathe out, all right? And that's about 500 ml. So the lung never collapses in you and me in the sense that the alveoli and the alveolar ducts, they don't actually collapse and they don't stick together. There's always a little bit of space. And why does that happen? That's because you have what you call as the expiratory reserve volume which is the extra volume that you can breathe out. Now I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. I'm not really working extra to push out anything, but I could push out extra. And that is your expiratory reserve volume. Even then, my alveoli don't completely collapse because I have something called as the res residual volume. And that keeps the alveoli a little open. Now, when you actually look at the... Um, the volumes and the capacities. Capacities would always be a sum of two volumes. So if I take the expiratory reserve volume, add the residual volume to it, you have the functional residual capacity. And this is what keeps our alveoli and our respiratory part of the um, bronchial, tracheal bronchial tree open, allowing air exchange to take place. The rest of it, which is in the conducting zone, is mostly dead space. There is, what does you mean by dead space? It means there is no air exchange that takes place in this place. It is mainly a conducting zone. So the aim or the purpose of all of this is to make sure that the respiratory part of the tree where the air exchange takes place is kept open. Otherwise that too becomes a dead space and does not take part in um, gas exchange. For gas exchange to completely take place, you've got the alveoli, <clears throat> the lining in the alveoli. You've got the little bit of the interstitial tissue around the alveoli, and then you have the, the lining of the blood vessel. So for good exchange to take place, all these three layers should be pliable, should be supple, and allow themselves to do the job. Any problem with any of these, again, prevents exchange of gases, prevents the oxygen getting into the bloodstream, the carbon dioxide being into the alveoli, out into the air from happening. And that again causes problems with oxygenation in the blood. So though there are other capacities and, and uh, volumes I have written here, if we can remember these main ones, then we would be able to understand what NIV does. So. Why do I need NIV and what is respiratory failure, right? 
So there are three components, as I mentioned, about breathing and to maintain balance. You have to have a an area that is able to generate the uh, power of breath, and that is your chest cavity. And you as a person who's able to do that, so the muscles, the bones, the pleura, the parenchyma, they should be able to take the load of how much you need to breathe. Next is the capacity of your muscles in itself. If your regular muscles don't use, you have your accessory muscles. And the last is the central drive. So if you look at the first picture, that is A, you have the respiratory load, which is working enough to help the respiratory muscles to actually work well. And you have the central drive that is keeping in balance and saying, you've taken a breath, that's enough, now let out a breath. And we keep going that way. But if you take B and you look at it, there is a fall in the central drive. So the ability of the oxygenation to be there is actually less because it doesn't drive the respiratory muscles. The stimulation is not there. So what happens, there is an increased uh, load on the respiratory mechanisms. So the respiratory load becomes more because your muscles aren't working. So what do we do? We work hard. The next one is the central drive. If you look at it, there is an increase in the central drive. So what happens there again, you can only breathe at some uh, at a certain rate beyond which there is decrease in muscle performance. And again, you feel tight in your chest, you're not able to breathe well. And the last one is to show where non-invasive comes back. So what non-invasive ventilation is trying to do is once again, if there is a problem in the central drive, if there is a problem in your respiratory muscles, this non-invasive ventilation is trying to bring about a balance and do some of the work that the respiratory mechanic, uh, mechanisms have to uh, work at. For example, the chest wall, the muscles, the parenchyma, and hence help in the body having better oxygenation and settling the central drive. I hope this gives you a slight understanding we'll move on. So if I have to make it much more easier, it is about like a balloon. If you look at the deflated balloon, it is stuck, isn't it? It's like taking a new balloon into your hand. So what happens? You're trying to blow. The amount of effort you have to put into first dilating this balloon to actually start to become compliant, to start to move is a lot. And actually, if you try to blow a really stiff balloon, you yourself get breathless. But once it opens to a certain point, it's easy to then blow it. Once you blow it again, it reaches a point where it's filled up to a certain level. And beyond that, if you want to expand it again, it's again difficult. So that's what this is. And what keeps this, if the balloon, once you've blown it up and it is not completely collapsed, it is easier for you the next time to open up the balloon. And that ability or that amount of air and compliance that has been there because the balloon is not stuck together, that is PEEP. And that is what is uh, maintained through non-invasive ventilation or ventilation in order to make sure that the lungs are able to open up better. Otherwise you get a very stiff lung. So the other thing to remember is in the lung, uh, though we've got, we've got an apex and a base, but they're never the same. So you've got the apex, which um, has the air bit actually going up more and you have the base where the perfusion is more. So if you can see about uh, blood flow and ventilation, though it is both higher a little bit in the apex is the most simplistic way to explain it. And in order to have a balance of the blood flow and the ventilation, that is what we call as the VQ. Uh, perfusion ratio. And you would hear a lot of people say there's a VQ mismatch. And that usually happens when there is a um, difference or there is an inadequate uh, ratio between ventilation and perfusion, which could happen because of a multitude of reasons. So type one respiratory failure, this and there's type two. So there are two types of respiratory failures. Type one it's usually where there is hypoxemia, meaning your oxygen level is low, but your carbon dioxide is still all right. And that happens when there is ventilation perfusion mismatch. And that could be because you have an anatomical shunt to begin with, all right, because with pneumonia or with any venous malformations. 
let's say you're at an altitude, the amount of oxygen that you have that you can breathe and your ability to breathe anyway is more difficult and hence a low partial pressure of inspired oxygen. Alveolar hyperventilation, if there's an imp impaired diffusion, any of these are going to cause a mismatch and prevent your body from having an oxygenation that is going to happen. So that is type one respiratory yeah. failure. Type two respiratory failure, on the other hand, is where you're either your drive, if you remember that picture, the drive. So the brain isn't telling the, the chest to say breathe. It is not picking up the signals that my pH has dropped, my carbon dioxide is building. And so what happens is the there is a break in the communication from the cortical stem. So issues such as spinal cord injuries, neuromuscular junction problems, paralysis of the respiratory muscles, peripheral nerve issues, any of these problems where there is a break in communication between your central drive and the actual place that works is going to cause a retention of carbon dioxide. You're not able to actually bring out the carbon dioxide. So here you have a loss of uh, oxygenation and you have a retention of carbon dioxide. This is type two respiratory failure. And what happens here is you have more of um, acidosis. You have more of pe the uh, patient being more restless, more agitated. Uh, not that the other doesn't, but this is where you have more problems with uh, especially COPD patients, okay? So what are the indications for NIV? Moderate to severe breathlessness, if you're tachypnic, there's increase in your work of breathing. So if you remember that picture, there is only a limit to which you can breathe fast, beyond which muscular fatigue takes place. And you're going to slowly try to not take much breath. They get tired. The effective breathing is not there anymore. They would probably just breathe such that you are only in your conducting pathway, which is dead space, and you're not going to actually have any oxygenation. So they get fatigued. There is uh, uh, drowsiness, you have the hemodynamic compromise that takes place. And when you do an ABG, you have that your pH is on the lower end, all right? And you are hypoxic. So if any of these issues where you're not washing out your carbon dioxide, you're not able to breathe well, you're not able to work at it, that is the time where you think, do I need to give this person non-invasive ventilation? So when you're talking about non-invasive ventilation, what does that mean? It basically means that I'm ventilating a person, an individual, without being invasive, without introducing anything, not tracheostomy or it's with um, uh, mechanical ventilation. So when I'm giving non-invasive ventilation, there are two ways in which I can give it. One is called a continuous positive airway pressure ventilation in NIV. So if you look at the picture below, that is about my normal breathing that I showed you in the spirometry, the uh, tidal volume. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. And there is a certain amount I'm breathing over and above my uh, residual capacity, uh, my uh, residual volume, all right? So now I'm actually going to show you what happens in CPAP. Now in CPAP, this is the normal breathing that is taking place at the bottom. But if you look at this, there is a certain pressure that has been um, uh, put into the machine. The machine gives you a certain pressure so that there is a constant positive pressure that is equivalent to what I explained as PEEP in the alveoli. So what happens? The alveoli do not collapse. There is already a little bit of air in it, which means that when a person triggers breathing. So when there is a breath, the triggering mechanism is there, the, the individual breathes and this machine gives the, the pressure that is already there. It is easy for the human being to actually take a breath. So there is pressure. I trigger it. I take a breath. It's much easier for me. The thing with this is it has to be synchronized. When I'm taking a breath, the, the machine and me should be synchronous with each other. It is then easier to breathe. The, uh, as written over there in CPAP, the respiratory muscles in the central drive is unaffected. So the, hum the individual on whom you put this should be able to trigger and should be able to carry on with the mechanism of breathing. 
In BiPAP, however, what happens is you are already there on the, uh, you're providing this peep at the bottom. So as you can see that pressure, you're going to start off higher. And what the blue bit that is at the bottom is the work that is done by the patient. All right. But the red bit that on top, that is what is done by the machine. In order to do this, there are two pressures that are indicated in the non-invasive ventilation. One, as I've written over there, it is the expiratory pressure, positive airway pressure, which is the PEEP. It keeps it open, the alveoli open. The human being starts to take a breath, but is unable to maintain it. And then you have the higher limit, which is the inspiratory positive airway pressure. So you have set a limit over there, all right? So the patient starts off with the airway being slightly open. He starts to take a breath, but he is unable to maintain it. And hence the machine gives that extra pressure that you have set. It keeps the breathing open. And then once it reaches the maximum, the trigger is gone. And then the person actually uh, exhales. This is how BiPAP works, okay? The difference between the IPAP, which is the inspiratory positive airway pressure, and the expiratory positive airway pressure is called as the pressure support. That is the pressure support that you are providing through BiPAP, which is biphasic positive airway pressure. This is the basic terminologies which you would have to understand when you're on the ward round, when the pulmonologist actually gives the values, the numbers that are written. What is it? Why are they giving it? If you can understand this basic, then it would help you um, understand what is happening. So the recommendation for non-invasive ventilation. Um, so it's the, the level one evidence is mainly for COPD exacerbations. It is there in order to facilitate in weaning or extubation in patients who then needed COPD, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and in immunosuppressed patients. There are level two, level three, and level four evidence for what we need to use an IV for. I will deal mainly with the common things that we find in palliative care. Before I go into that, uh, there are various delivery uh, modalities for non-invasive ventilation. One is the oronasal mask. It covers the nose and the oral cavity like this. One is nasal. It is just on the nose. This actually helps because they can eat, they can drink, but there is a loss of pressure in the nasal mask. Oronasal is actually uh, better because it covers the nose and the mouth, but is uncomfortable. It can be very claustrophobic. It's very difficult to maintain communication and eat and drink. The pillows, again, it's into the nasal cavity. Total face covers the entire bit, and this is more comfortable, but yet, as you can see, it is not the most communicative or the one that allows interactions. Mouthpiece and helmet. So these are the common, um, these are the modalities, interfaces is what they're called, that can be used for non-invasive ventilation. The oronasal is the most commonly seen one in the wards. So I've talked to you about uh, indications. The contraindications become important. So if you have, because the mask sits here, if you are a person who has any facial deformity, trauma, burns, you can't put it and hence it's contraindicated. If you are constantly vomiting, it is very difficult because when the pressure comes, you will, you will aspirate. If there are a lot of secretions, it's the same principle why it would be contraindicated. When a person comes in severe hypoxemia, you trial of an NIV is contraindicated. You will have to look into the causes and decide if this patient is one for mechanical ventilation. And if there is a lot of hemodynamic instability, you have to first settle mm -hmm. those and decide what you need to do. Uh, severe comorbidities, confusion, agitation, a low GCS, and inability to protect airways. This is the common sense way in saying, these are problems. If this is too much, am I okay to give any sort of ventilation? What is my goal of care? If it is okay for me to give ventilation, is it right for me to give a trial? Is it wrong? Or do I go on to mechanical ventilation? That is something that you'll have to decide as a team. 
So in immunocompromised patients, there is a lot of literature out there, that's especially in patients who are, let's say, in cancer, and they are actually um, subjected to chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy. So what happens is there is neutropenia, they are susceptible to infections, they, uh, their ability, the fatigability is far more, and um, they are uh, just unable to perform as their performance status comes down. So when you have immunocompromised patients, especially when we are talking such as in malignancy, or if you have in uh, HIV, any of these uh, issues where lungs are a problem, they are actually, um, they find that you have to then segregate the cause. You have to understand is the person, how far along in their performance status are they? What is it that they're able to do? What is their functionality? And what is the purpose of what I'm going to do? So a person who has just started off with chemotherapy and a person who is developed a lung infection, um, or while they're actually being hydrated, have developed a pulmonary edema because of fluid overload. These are patients with whom NIV is quite uh, helpful. If they are young, then is mechanical ventilation a possibility? Is a discussion that you will have, as, to, have to, to have as a team. The dilemma over here comes is when there is a patient, let's say an advanced uh, situation of immunocompromise and they develop breathlessness, what do I do? Do I give NIV or don't I give NIV? So the recommendation actually is that early NIV in immunocompromised patient with respiratory failure is actually possible if their performance status, if their condition is actually better. So it is a conditional recommendation. There is no blanket thing that with new immunocompromised patients, NIV will help. There is no blanket uh, recommendation in that. If you take NIV in cancer, as I mentioned, cardiogenic pulmonary edema is quite common, uh, either because there is a cardiac compromise with chemotherapy, fluid overload, lung compliance may be less, paclitaxel induced uh, interstitial lung issues could be there. There are various other chemotherapies that cause a problem, or it could be a patient who already has an underlying lung issue, who now has pulmonary metastasis uh, that is compromising them further. It could be because of a pulmonary embolism. It could be alveoli hemorrhage, um, lymphangiectasis. Any of these could actually cause a respiratory problem in a cancer patient. So what do I do? How do I actually go about this? Pulmonary infection and cardiogenic uh, pulmonary edema, when you put NIV, though I said that they're really good uh, evidence to say pulmonary edema and NIV really work, helps uh, pulmonary edema, failure rates are higher in, ca cardiac, in uh, cancer patients and those with pulmonary infection. The conversation between an oncologist and the palliative team has to be very important. The conversation between oncology, palliation, pulmonology team has to be very important. There is nothing in the uh, books about a clear cut single department decision in, in, in uh, trying to understand if NIV should be given or not. The other very important people in this decision making is the patient and the family. So at what stage of cancer are they? As I've mentioned before, what are the goals of care? What do I need to do? How bad is the ABG? How bad is the person's situation? All of that actually goes into uh, final carrying out of non-invasive ventilation. And in the palliative setting, the recommendation is that if you're actually trying to uh, manage any of the symptoms, a dyspneic patient is the one in palliation in the setting of terminal cancer that you could use for palliative purpose to reduce, reduce dyspnea. Otherwise, it is purely conditional. All right, you have to put all your eggs into the basket to understand if it is important, is it going to be helpful? So you divide them into three categories. You divide them into life support, where there is no preset limitations on life-sustaining treatment. So I have a young patient. He's quite, the performance status is good. 
He was receiving chemotherapy. There is no talk here about uh, advanced disease. He is able to tolerate chemo. They're actually thinking that I'm going to give another six cycles of chemotherapy. This is where you say, I have no limitation. The family goals are aggressive. Then you do NIV in the initial phases to see if it is possible for them to respond to it. If they do, great. If not, am I doing mechanical ventilation? The next group of people who you would say that, yes, uh, the family and the patients do not want to have endotracheal intubation, but they want everything done as much as possible to keep the patient comfortable, to try everything that is needed. So you have a dyspneic patient, you have somebody in fluid overload, they're saying, I don't want ICU, I want you, you do the best that you can. So we, we, get, we support, uh, get supported from our pulmonology colleagues and our onco colleagues, and we say, let's see if NIV can actually be helpful in this situation. The last group is where I just mentioned to you, they are purely supportive and comfort care. They don't want anything, but my patient is breathless. So will NIV help in this situation? So the risk factors are there uh, that have been identified in studies for uh, NIV failure. One is male gender. One is a higher Apache or a SAP score. I've written on the left side what it is. Please do look it up. If the patient is in hemodynamic instability and you're breathless and you're saying, I want to give NIV, then the chances of failure are very high. If I have severe ARDS secondary to infection and shock, then my chances that NIV will help are very low. And if after providing NIV for one to two hours, there's no improvement, then my chances that NIV is gonna help is very low. Why, am, why are we telling you this? Because you, when you have family meetings, when you have discussions with the relatives, mm -hmm. if the patient is uh, being spoken to earlier before putting on NIV for permission, you as physicians need to know as the entire team, what is my goal? If they are going to sit in front of me and say, is this going to help? I need to know whether this is going to help. Otherwise, communication with them and helping decision-making becomes very, very difficult. The other situation where we use NIV is in amyotropic lateral sclerosis or in anything like, like is in a neuromuscular problem. Now, I've just put this graph just very simply. If you look at the middle one, the first one is all patients, that is those with NIV and with controls. The last one is in towards the end of their life where are, are their disease. And this, the middle one is in places where people are having a problem in breathing, but they are in a good performance status. They've got some life left. They've got some um, ability left to fight this, all right? So if you look at it, the middle one, actually NIV will help in the middle group. It showed that there is a significant improvement and prolongation of life when you use NIV in patients with neuromuscular problems when they are still in their early stages to moderate, moderate severity. But if you use it much later when they are fatigued, when they are towards the, the disease process is towards the end, the effectivity or their prolongation in life or improvement in quality of life is not much. So the recommendation is that it can be used in patients if the PCO2, PACO2 is more than 45. But please remember the stage of the illness is also important. I cannot go only by my blood gas. If I have somebody towards um, the end, and if I'm going to tell them, please do NIV, it is going to improve your system symptoms really well. It may improve for a short period of time, but they cannot sustain it. And the mortality and the morbidity that would be there would be quite similar to somebody who has not used non-invasive ventilation. The next is an acute cardiogenic edema. Again, NIV, if you actually look at the picture, there is a preload that is high on the left ventricle and your pulmonary vein is backed up and hence there is alveolar space that is filled up with fluid. So what does NIV do? It actually helps in improving the respiratory mechanics. It improves in the left ventricular work by decreasing the ventricular afterload. So definitely the recommendation is a level one uh, evidence to show that NIV is very useful in acute cardiogenic edema. The use of NIV, 
uh, there are these graphs. It's nothing that uh, what I would like to show you is that the use of NIV has actually become much higher. The first one is uh, heart failure. The second one is COPD. So you can understand now that NIV is used more and mechanical ventilation is actually on the lower trend. So because of that, our understanding of what we need to know with NIV becomes important as palliative physicians because um, they are referred to us to say that their dyspnea can help. And as palliative physicians, not NIV is not the only answer that we've got. We've got non-pharmacological and pharmacological measures. Optimizing everything together is what is important. Putting the total pain concept, if you take it back, the uh, biopsychosocial model of anything. So it is not just about the lung, the compliance, the NIV, the CPAP, the IPAP. Who am I putting it to? What is the personality of this patient? What is upsetting them? What is the anxiety in this patient? Are they going to be able to tolerate it? Is the family okay? If we don't address this as a complete holistic approach, NIV in itself is not going to work. Most of the studies that are out there are to find out if NIV can actually prevent a person from going on to invasive mechanical ventilation. So these are the statistics from that. But if you actually have to look into from the palliative perspective, you have to look at all these features. Otherwise, NIV provision towards the end especially is not going to be helpful. And in patients um, in palliation, they actually did a 12 month study in this uh, paper. And they found that readmission rates, especially in the COPD group, they found yes, the, the readmission rates were better. But if you looked at the graph, the first three months they felt was where you would actually benefit from long-term NIV. But after three months, there was not much difference in the quality or in the, um, uh, the progression rate of support that needed to be given. So um, going on to end-of-life care and NIV, there was a study by the French pulmonologists and the palliative care physicians. There was a survey held. What do people really give NIV for from the physician's point of view, not the patient point of view? And they realized that most of the time that we say is, my gosh, the patient is so dress, rest, uh, dysnic, please can we give NIV? If there's the emotional comfort to the relatives. So there were many factors that were there and a lot of it had to do with the individual's perception of what I can give, what I cannot give, should I or shouldn't I? And actually wherever palliative physicians were there, the understanding of NIV was actually better. And hence our role is very, very important. So near end of life, do I give, don't I give? So the downfall to that is, I would be unduly delaying the, the, the process of dying. I may increase the anxiety and the depression because it's the most difficult thing to have this on me. And when I'm trying to actually provide supportive care through medications, if I have made the patient comfortable, then giving an NIV, is it going to actually add further benefit is a question you will have to actually ask yourselves. Am I increasing the patient's suffering? as the agitation becoming more just because of the NIV? Am I increasing the cost of the patient by saying, look, I have to keep you here for NIV? Is the patient, especially in our resource poor settings, is, are they able to sustain this at home? Who is going to support them? How am I going to educate them? Is it going to be possible for me to make sure that I'm able to follow up this patient once I send them home? What happens if the patient's GCS falls? Who's going to monitor it? Hence, all these problems are going to actually be factors that the palliative team has to actually look into. And we are more than capable of doing it if we sit in an interdisciplinary manner and make a protocol for each of yourselves in each hospital. And if we could get together as one and make it, it would be wonderful because the literature out there is not that evidence-based to help guide us with clarity at the end of life. Quickly on to inotropes. Inotropes are basically medications that improve the contractility of the heart. Now, both these topics are very good to understand the dilemma that we as human beings face 
because uh, palliative physicians, yes, we are palliative physicians, but we're human beings. And the reason that we are all here is because we are an empathetic um, group and it affects us when we see somebody suffer. Um, and hence, a lot of thought goes into, I can do this in medicine. I can actually give this medicine. I can do this intervention. But by doing this intervention, am I burdening my patient or am I benefiting my patient? And what is the point I have to introduce this intervention? These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. So inotropes actually helps improve the contractility of the heart. And it is used in patients who have a low cardiac output or if there's an evidence of end stage organ failure. Now, I'm not going to go through all the uh, classification of inotropes because it's beyond the time that I could spend on this talk and the purview of this talk. The recent classification, however, they have divided them as calcitropes, which modulate calcium signaling, myotropes that act on the sarcomia through calcium independent mechanism, and mitotropes that actually help uh, exert their action on mitochondrial activity. These have actually tried to help us understand the place of action, what can be used in palliative care, and what can be used if you're giving ambulatory support of inotropes for patients or on an outpatient basis. So the um, guidelines actually define advanced heart failure as anybody who's had NYHA class three or class four. If a patient's ejection fraction is less than 30%, or if there are frequent episodes of pulmonary and systemic congestion, and if there is severe impairment of exercise capacity. On the right-hand bottom, I've given you a brief summary of that. Mm -hmm. So if you have any mm -hmm. of these, then it becomes a uh, advanced heart failure. There is a word called refractory heart failure that can be used, but again, this is an interchangeable term. It's called refractory if it implies a lack of response to treatment. It is also called refractory if there's a lack of reversibility of the impaired cardiac function. But neither of these are equivalent to advanced heart failure. The problem with COPD and heart failure are that you don't have a clear cut place where you can say, this is where things are gonna go wrong because there are constant dips and improvements. So the management is as in this, it can either be to improve symptoms and prognosis, to improve just the symptoms, or is it purely supportive care? And the guideline directed medical therapy, which is GDMT is what we use. So it could be pharmacological, or it could be due to uh, devices that we can use, or it can be due to the medications such as inotropes, or is it because of peritoneal dialysis or ultrafiltration towards the end? or is it purely supportive care? So you have many modalities of management. This is a list of uh, inotropes that are used in end-stage uh, heart failure. You are common, you're familiar with quite a few of them. Each comes with its positives and its negatives. And the use of this is something that we as palliative physicians would have to talk with our cardiology uh, colleagues to help understand. Points to remember in advanced heart failure, you have kidney dysfunction, which is called as the cardiorenal syndrome, and you do develop diuretic resistance. So loop diuretics, it's called the breaking phenomenon. There is a change in your nephron. There is increased renin secretion. So your hormonal balance of what keeps your endocrine system of what's happening actually gets imbalanced, and hence you have a problem. So in advanced heart failure, where we are trying to give medications, be aware that though you keep increasing the dose of your loop diuretics, there may be a point where there is a resistance to it and hence your medications change accordingly. When you give inotropes, which are calcium based and there is a raise in the intracellular calcium, Again, over here, you could have heart failure, which may not respond. Why? Or you might have heart failure that progresses despite this. Why? It's because there is a initial improvement in hemodynamic status, but then the patient does not particularly have an improvement in outcome. So my expectation towards what the reality is are going to be different. The other major thing is that when you're constantly increased contractility of a failing heart, 
for some time, the myocardium will sustain it. But with the increased work and oxygen consum consumption by the, by the myofibrils, there is going to be a decrease in your myocardial function. And the benefits of cardiac, uh, sorry, chronic inotrope use are limited depending whether you have an ischemic problem or it's a non-ischemic problem. So while we are giving inotropes, we need to understand what is the reason that we're giving it. These are all the randomized studies that have been done or case studies, control studies that have been done. Overall, it shows that there is a great improvement in using inotropes in patients, especially when they are um, logged on to with um, your uh, diuretics and uh, your beta blockers or your other cardiac medications. But the mortality isn't that changed with many of these medications. Again, it depends on whether, which class of heart failure you're in. If you have come towards the later part, then adding all these medications do not increase the longevity or produce great symptom relief. Intermittent inotrope infusion, there is a class three recommendation, but for continuous palliative inotrope therapy, there is a class 2B recommendation, but you've got to remember at which stage you're actually giving the inotropes. These are some of the various devices that have been used. There are positive and negatives to each. And when you have these devices, it's important to understand, <clears throat> especially where you have the uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy and defibrillators, as the disease progresses and the patient becomes terminal, these can be deactivated. Trying to provide inotropes, trying to provide medications to help with the heart failure, but not turning this off, prolongs death and uh, suffering. And most of the times it has been shown to studies that people are not aware that they can be deactivated. This again becomes a talk for family meetings and interdisciplinary discussions. Left ventricular assist devices are, um, also with sustainable substantial risks that come, including infection and long-term hospitalizations and symptom burden. So remember that when we talk to patients and they have these devices, if we are talking about turning them off, inotropes are not going to sustain their hemodynamic status nor prolong their life. So the talk would be that if we are turning these devices off, that we would be expecting it to be an imminent demise. So the challenges are accurate. Ac the person should be able to understand the hemodynamic assessment, the renal dysfunction, optimize your vasodilators and diuretics, thinking that I'm just going to give my inotropes without optimizing will not work. Once again, the mechanisms of the heart, outflow obstruction, no matter how much you're going to try and increase the contractility, if I have outflow obstructions, I'm not going to be benefiting by starting inotropes. Economic factors, psychosocial factors, again over here, your degree of dependency. What does the patient relative want? There are some patients we have experienced, 80 year old, multiple heart uh, problems, twice stent has been put in, come back with mitral stenosis, severe breathlessness on uh, inotropes already. The relatives come back and they say, I want you to do something else to prolong life. I want you to do something else to make sure he has years added to his life. But the quality in those years is not good. So where we understand what needs to be done, if we speak to the relatives, they are then able to make better decisions. Uh, the potential risk is what I've mentioned, and I'll come to the quality of life of long-term mortality of patients with advanced chronic heart failure. They have actually shown that the only places where there is a pro probable improvement in the quality of life and mortality is one, if they're at a younger age, because they have the tenacity to fight back. The presence of worse renal function. So you might say, what is this? How can it improve? So it gives you a very brief illusion of improvement because you have edema, you have actually breathlessness, which if there is a improvement in the renal function by any of the modalities of treatment we use, there is a sudden improvement in symptoms. But with the worsening of the renal function, 
it is not going to help with the quality of life. So people might initially say, oh my God, I've improved, but that's not the actual case. And the presence of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. If it is non-ischemic, then there is a probable role in improving the quality of life and mortality. So understanding it becomes important. And if we have to understand when we have to talk, we need to understand what is the point where we have this conversation. And this is a mnemonic, uh, I need help. Please do go through it. Um, it's um, the points that we would have to understand is, when do I use the inotropes? Is there a use and which inotrope do I use? What is the heart condition before I start the inotropes? What is my N or NYHA classification? Am I in the earlier stages or later stages? Is there any end organ dysfunction? What is the ejection fraction? Because the lower the ejection fraction, I'm not going to be able to have the benefit of an inotrope the way I would expect it to have. Uh, am I having re uh, recurrent uh, appropriate defibrillator shocks that are coming if I have a, a device implanted? Am I having more hospitalizations? Am I uh, actually seeing this patient who is going to have, having repeated uh, fluid overload? Is uh, the diuretics that is being used becoming more? Is there hemodynamic instability? And what are the things that I'm actually using to increase? Have I reached the end? I have, have I done the best that I can and my patient is still not improving? Involvement of the palliative physician earlier on in either the pulmonary or the cardiac palliative care becomes very important because this decline that is going to happen can have sudden exacerbations where they improve, sudden exacerbation they improve, but they've not improved to their previous ability. So when that decline starts to be seen, then these questions, if they're asked, as I had mentioned for NIV and for inotropes, it helps us understand what is going to help them and what is not. And for us to understand, to have that conversation and to be able to answer the questions, we have to have a clarity as to what each of these things do and don't do. What is our dilemma? What is our own personal views on it? And what is this evidence against it and what we feel and what is evidence are two different things. Going through these evidence, I've actually, you can have these slides. There are guidelines that I've given as references below. Please do go through them. So the guide again would be understand advanced heart failure, identify the decline in the disease trajectory, <clears throat> discuss with the patient where possible, but with the family, definitely. Identify your surrogate decision maker, goals of care, Always do this as an interdisciplinary team because the skills and the knowledge that our pulmonology colleagues, cardiology colleagues have, and our knowledge are different. We bring empathy, we bring emotion, we bring holistic, but we will not be able to do what we do if we don't work as a team. Communication in advanced disease, always preparing and talking about the pros and cons is always important with the family. It helps decision-making, angry patients, are always patients where communication hasn't been complete or given the time for. And hence that becomes very important. And the most important thing in all aspects is what we have discussed as consultants, as palliative physicians, that communication should be translated to all the other levels of uh, care, professional caregivers. Otherwise there is going to be miscommunication and mismanagement and wrong information provided, which leads to confusion. Thank you. I hope it's it's been a very brief overview because it's a very big topic. Um, Amelia, yeah. this is too good. Whether Raghavender has joined, I mean, Raghavender, are you there? Yeah, 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 please go, like go, to... go ahead. Go ahead, please. Go so, ahead. Dr. Amelia has right. actually done an excellent job in actually just not trying to put across what it is about uh, the understanding of the uh, the evidence which is to actually uh, dissect your uh, ethical concerns. I would like to mention two things. As a palliative care physician, I think I and Dr. Amelia go through this a lot, especially Dr. Amelia who wanted to make this topic as a pediatric thing, but I told you, you can't be making it as pediatric because it's not a mention as pediatric. That is where the ethical dilemma comes about more, wherein your obligation to provide something becomes very, very difficult because young age, they will all fight out saying that it's going to be necessary for you to provide the non-invasive ventilation. Whereas you have to stop, but you can't stop because you are ethically inhibited. That is, you are actually going to be 
prohibited by your other colleagues that is could be pediatrician could be your respiratory physician or your cardiologist so you are actually on a double edged sword over here so the best thing what dr amelia was keep repeating is please have your teams sorted out better first i think if you have a good understanding with your pulmonologist or a cardiologist that is where it is important to actually take this to diffusion wherein you have evidence and you can go and talk to your colleagues saying that this evidence is going to back you uh, in in actually telling saying that this is of no use when it comes to long term especially in younger age group pediatric that is where in cancer issues ethical issues could be there for a period of time but it is time limited you know that's going to be an end somewhere in in your respiratory whereas if you have something like a neurological concern as dr ramilia was rightly mentioning or she did mention about copd and other things it's going to go on and that is where your issues are going to be the biggest of the problems is is it type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure and these failures could lead to a lot of issues wherein you could lose autonomy the patient might lose autonomy because of various other problems once the patient loses autonomy your surrogate decision could be really really difficult then the physician is going to have obligation to provide whereas if there is autonomy and there is no clear understanding of their prognosis which dr amelia was mentioning every time as a palliative care physician they visit your clinic please tell them what is their prognosis then the issue is they will be made to actually provide be provided by you so therefore both issues are going to be there so autonomy non maleficence beneficence this is where we are going to hit now if we are going to get affected what's going to be the next i think i have learned from uh, sushma ma'am saying that how to handle burnout and unless and until these ethical issues are not dealt with and debrief yourself with your own colleagues could be with the pulmonologist himself after uh, after you have had discussion please don't have a face off and if you have a face off then it's going to be difficult for actually continuing this and always camaraderie is very very important and sushma ma'am has been very very uh, put, putting across very very kindly to all of them as a senior most she says please wait you have to have that patience otherwise it's going to be very difficult i think with this i will actually close my uh, remarks uh, if there are any suggestions anything you're more than welcome uh, sushma ma'am so can you see the questions if there are any uh, everything i think it, this is all praise to amelia i think this was a fantastic presentation i also can endorse this and uh, i'm Thank so happy i am so happy that palliative medicine in this country is going in absolutely right direction young people like amelia are understanding basics first and then they are trying to uh, um, uh, integrate the concept of palliative medicine it is not always saying that we can't do we should not put niv it is always so all those who are listening i think this is so important to understand that what exactly the niv when patient will need an iv whether patient will be benefited with an iv you should have all everything by should be evidence based otherwise nobody will going to listen you and you will get frustrated so it is important that improve your knowledge first and then talk to the colleagues if you will not improve your knowledge and if you will try to convince them that this there is no use of no, non invasive ventilation in this patient nobody is going to listen to you so it's amelia has started with basic concept basic anatomy understanding of niv and you know when it's directly from mbbs all palliative medicine students are coming and nobody has taught them about this all these things so this is important that you have to learn you have to learn and i'm so happy today that the way you have explained i think palliative medicine residents will really get be really be benefited not only from today's class but always residents remember if you will not understand the medicine behind the patient and if you will not know your patient please don't talk to anybody first knowing your patient is most important if you are not understanding if you are not understanding the concept take your own time understand first that what is happening to the patient what exactly i should explain to the relatives what exactly i should talk to my colleagues these are most important things then only our, our specialty will grow otherwise this specialty cannot grow if we will just keep on talking that we will not put niv this is not going to be useful you they every where there there is there should be an evidence that 
this is the evidence i'm talking and this is the way i'm telling and the way she has explained about this um, recently this about uh, last article which you have explained about uh, pulmonologist uh, with the palliative care physicians and without palliative care physician i think this was such a beautiful example so uh, this uh, this is the way we have to convince and we have to g- g- gain respect amongst the specialty so you are the people those who will create evidence you are the people who will follow evidence and you are the people who will gain respect of this specialty i think all seniors have done their best to bring specialty till here but i am again requesting that we are starting md and dnb in many many stay many many places and uh, it is important that all the mentors or the teachers of those institutions they should be themselves will be should knowing they should be knowing themselves and then they should teach their residents like this what amelia has taught today thank you very much it is it was so good amelia it is 7:30 we have to stop thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am archana what i will see i will request you that please pass over all the comments to amelia hmm? sure, whatever ma'am. there in the chat box okay thank you very much for joining everyone we will thank see you ma'am have a good day bye before 6:30 and thank you raghavender thank you thank archana you, and thank you nisha okay